I recently became interested in 10 gigabit SMB multi-channel and I wanted to be able to test that at home. And to do that, I needed a switch with preferably at least five 10 gigabit interfaces so that I could have two for a computer, two for a NAS, and one for an uplink to the internet if I wanted to test it that way. I went online and I came across the Binadat 10G06-0402 GSM at 190 US dollars. And what's amazing about this switch is that it has six ports, four of which are copper, two are SFP plus, and it's fully managed, and it's a layer three device, which is incredible. So if other devices in the marketplace that you would look at uh, in comparison to the Binadat is the TP-Link TL-SX105, which costs 250 US dollars. It has five copper interfaces, but it's unmanaged. And the other one to consider would be the Netgear XS505M at 329 US dollars. Again, unmanaged. Now, access to the management interface isn't like most of the layer three switches that I've used before. There's no serial interface. Instead, management is done in band. You just have to set your computer to the address 192.168.2. something, a number between two and 254. And then you just bring up a browser, you type in to the browser 192.168.2.1, that's the default address for the Binadat. Um, then it, pr it prompts you with a login page, you use the default username and password admin admin, and you're in. Given the price of the Binadat, I was expecting a terrible user interface. When you log in, it may be a little plain looking, but it's very intuitive for someone who's a network engineer, which I've done in my career and it has every feature that you could conceivably want to configure in the graphic interface. You don't really have to go to the command line to configure anything because it's virtually all here as far as I can tell. And the interface looks a lot better than some I've used. Some older versions of HP switches, which I come across in my career, have a shockingly bad, unintuitive interface, but this one's actually pretty good. Everything's where you think it should be, and it's logical um, and well set out for someone who's worked with switches in the past. Having said that, if you're someone who's comfortable with the command line, it's very easy to use the graphic interface to turn on SSH, and then you can SSH into the device, and the command line interface looks remarkably similar to Cisco's. And so if you're familiar with Cisco's CLI, then this, you'll have no trouble at all adapting to this device's commands. This switch is a layer three switch, which really just means it's a router. To uh, test the routing capability, I set up two VLANs and I assigned an interface to each VLAN. I plugged a computer into each of those interfaces and gave them appropriate IP addresses. And then I ran iPerf between the two computers. And yes, it had no trouble keeping up to, with the 10 gigabit uh, routing. So it, as far as I'm concerned, it's just fine as a router at 10 gigabits. Even more amazing about the switch and the operating system is just how many features it has. Um, I'll list them on this page here. You can pause it and have a look, but there's, there's too many for me to talk about. It's way more features than I would ever want in a switch that I've ever wanted in a switch, especially a small five port switch for home. But if you're interested in learning about networking, this switch is actually probably a good choice. You, you can learn a lot of, you can try out a lot of features at a very low cost. Uh, it's an extremely capable device. Okay, so having heaped a fair bit of praise on the switch, there are some very good reasons why you would choose not to get this and instead get something like the TP-Link TL-SX105 instead, even though that switch has one less port and costs a little bit more. The biggest reason for me is that this switch is incredibly loud. Well, I measured it at one meter and it makes 50 decibels in a, a room with a noise floor of 35 decibels. It's very loud. And the reason is I opened it up and there are two fans pointing over the top of two chips inside, obviously to keep them cool. But the design of those fans is that it, they blow straight down on top and they circulate air within the switch itself. But there's no mechanism to pull cooler outside air in and there's no mechanism to slow the fans down if the chips are not actually hot. It appears that the fans run at full speed the whole time, so they make the maximum amount of noise. And it is disturbingly loud. I definitely couldn't have it in this room recording, and I definitely couldn't have it in this room with me working, because it's frankly, it's just too distracting. If you can put the switch into, say, a closet or another room, 
uh, where, you, where the noise is not going to bother you, then fine, that's great. That's a good solution, but it's way too loud for me. Now, being a fully managed switch means that it uses a little bit more power than an unmanaged switch. Uh, in this case, when you turn it on with no devices plugged in and fully booted, it will draw 8 watts. And for every device you attach at 10 gigabits, it will basically use about 1.5 watts per port. So there's six ports, meaning when it's fully loaded and working, it'll draw about 22 watts. Now that's actually a fair bit of power and it's probably a reason why those two fans exist. But disappointingly, the case actually gets reasonably warm, but not like dangerously warm. So I measured it at 48 degrees with six devices plugged in, which is pretty warm to the touch, but not outrageously so. For comparison, I've got a QNAP with two 10 gigabit ports and four two and a half gigabit ports. When they're all plugged in, the QNAP switch isn't even warm to the touch. The device comes with a 24 watt power brick, so it seems to be perfectly sized for the device, really. If you want to know the cost to run it, using the average US residential power price for 2025, which Google says is 16 cents per kilowatt hour, Running the switch full time with all ports connected, so using 23 watts or so, will cost you about $32 a year. One issue I encountered is with the two SFP Plus ports. Now I tried a generic fs.com supplied multi-mode SFP Plus adapter in there and it worked just fine. But then I tried a generic fs.com SFP Plus copper adapter and it wouldn't work. I couldn't make it work. There are options within the configuration of the port to manually tell it what kind of adapters in there. And there is no copper option in the graphic interface. When you go to the CLI, there is actually an option for copper, but the adapter wouldn't work. So I actually sent off an email to Binadat, um, having doubt that such a cheap switch would have any kind of support at all. But to their credit, they replied. And what they said was that we should be using their branded SFP Plus adapters which seemed odd to me given the generics work for multi-mode, but I spent $40 on their brand of copper SFP Plus adapter and plugged it in and it worked. Um, so if you are expecting to be able to use your own adapters, generics, you'll either need to reflash them so that they pretend to be Binadat ones, or you'll pay 40 US dollars per adapter for a 30 meter copper SFP Plus adapter. That's not a terrible outcome, uh, I was actually impressed that Binadat had good support or a responsive support team, and there is a working solution. But if you're planning on using it for copper like I am, there's a little bit more extra expense compared to using generics. The switch has the capability to apply software updates, but when I went onto the Binadat website, I couldn't see very many software updates for the switches at all. So there's none available for this particular model. I guess I was surprised about the responsiveness of the support team, so maybe if you discover a bug and report it, they'll fix it and offer a patch. But at this point, it's not the kind of switch that updates its OS very often. This switch represents amazing value. It's a six port, 10 gigabit switch with full management and layer three capability, and it has a cost per port that defeats anything else that I could find on the Amazon store at least. So it's incredible value. If you can put up with the sound problems and maybe the tiny amount of quirkiness with the SFP Plus ports that I identified and possibly questionable software updates for the future, then you should definitely put it on your list to buy. It's a really solid product uh, re that represents great value. So yeah, go ahead and buy it if you want to. I'm gonna put an Amazon affiliate link down below, so please click it and I'll get a little bit of cash if you do. Um, go for it. That's it for this video. If you liked it, please give it a thumbs up. And if you're interested in watching more content from me like that, then feel free to subscribe. Thanks for watching.